Thank you for that lovely introduction. How's the sound? Are we okay? Yes? Okay. Well, we will get started here in just a moment. There is some, well, there's a stink bug on the microphone. <laughs> we got him. Now it's on me. There we go. Um, there's a little bit of feedback. Is that okay? Okay, so I wanted to give just, oh, I'll wait till we get that fixed. Sorry. Okay, I think that's better. I wanted to give a huge thanks to the Frontier Culture Museum, to the Board of Directors, and especially to Doretta and Paige for inviting me to speak to you tonight. I'm really happy to be here. I had a beautiful drive um, over on 26 and up on 81. It was sunny, it was gorgeous, and Virginia is beautiful. Um, and a big, big thanks to the Book Dragon for being here and for bringing my book. Um, okay, we're still working on sound. How's that? That's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, even though they're not here, I'm going to thank University of Georgia Press because if it weren't for them, then I wouldn't have a book to talk about. Um, and I also want to thank Tim Barnwell, who is a photographer based in Asheville, who took this cover image. Um, and he gave me permission to use it, and he also took several other photographs that are in the book, and I'm really indebted to him. The woman's uh, name who was photographed here is Bertha Marler, and she's from Marshall, North Carolina, which is in Madison County, next door to Buncombe County, and this picture was taken in 1983. Um, okay, so I think the best plan of action to get us situated is to read a little bit from the introduction. This only takes about 10 minutes and then we'll get into the presentation. Does the sound sound okay to you all? I don't think it sounds great. Do you want, do you want me to just yell? Do you want me to try? Okay, can you hear me? Is that better? Yes. Okay, so thank you for being here. You heard my introduction. You heard my thank yous. Um, I'm going to read from the introduction to the book, and I promise not to make it too long, but I hope it will set up what I'm talking about. Give me a thumbs up if I'm loud enough. Okay, good receptive audience. This is good. Okay, <clears throat> my maternal grandmother kept everything from disposable pie pans repurposed as cat food bowls to balls of yellowed aluminum foil that cracked apart in your hand to a dusty seashell knickknack on permanent display from a beach trip long since taken she was not one to throw things away she even kept her wood cook stove after purchasing an electric one both still occupy her kitchen in an appliance standoff of old versus new. This inclination makes sense. Born in 1915, she was a teenager during the Great Depression. Though her family fared well overall, during those years and for many after, she learned to save things that might later prove useful. When she passed away in 1996, she left behind a house full of treasures mixed with all the things she might need someday. Rather than cleaning out the house then, my bachelor uncle continued to occupy it and his other home just down the road. When he passed away in 2014, my mother and her sister finally started the long, arduous process of sorting through the things that had been accumulating since 1946, when my grandparents moved into the house. Going through all of my grandmother's things is a job that will probably never be completed, but my mother keeps trying. By the summer of 2016, I had started working on this project. It has been a long haul. <laughs> and after one of her exhausting cleaning sprees, my mother called to tell me that she had found something I might be interested in seeing. 
As she often does, she began by listing all the reasons I might not really want to see the mystery object. It was old, it was dirty, it was in poor condition, it must have been stored in the smokehouse for a number of years because mice had nibbled its pages, and surely I would not be interested in such a bedraggled thing. After a long list of why not, she finally told me that she had found a cookbook my grandmother made. So there it is. Tim took the picture for me, and I'll keep reading about it. My initial reaction is the reason I believe Appalachia on the table and many more books like it need to be written. I was surprised. My grandmother, Bernice Ramsey Robinson, was an avid reader her entire adult life until macular degeneration rendered her favorite pastime impossible. And she was one of the most intellectually curious people I've ever known. She was also creative sewing beautiful, colorful quilts that she passed on to various family members. She kept her French textbooks from college and could still recite poetry she had memorized decades earlier. So I was not surprised that she made her own cookbook with a photograph album cut to size for the cover. You can barely make out the letters there. It's the R-A-P-H-S and the photos on the other side. Uh, and black string to hold it together. Nor is I surprised that the cookbook adhered to genre conventions. It even has a section for home remedies and health tips in the back, complete with advice about how to relax properly by stretching. My favorite clipping offers advice for mailing fruitcakes, recommending that bakers line a box with waxed paper and bury a gaily wrapped cake in freshly popped corn, which adds, quote, a festive touch to the gift and cushions it for mailing. Even a quick flip through the cookbook reveals that my grandmother subscribed to a number of different publications, was interested in many varied approaches to cooking, and was well-versed in how to organize a cookbook to resemble one that had been published by a press. What surprised me were the recipes. Of course, I had heard about my grandmother's cooking from my mother, though I never experienced her homemade meals. By the time I came along, she was crooked over with osteoporosis and relied on convenience foods like frozen banquet fried chicken with canned biscuits and canned vegetables to feed us when we helped her set tobacco every spring. But I had heard about the fresh fried chicken, vegetables from the garden, and chocolate gravy drizzled on biscuits for dessert that appeared on the table during my mother's childhood. Maybe that's why I had written my own culinary script for my grandmother that turned out to be naive, close-minded, and downright wrong. <laughs> I make my living reading, writing, and teaching about Appalachia and its people. As a seventh-generation Western North Carolinian, I am keenly aware of the hurtful and lasting impact stereotypes about mountain people have. So why was I so surprised to learn that my grandmother had not one, but two identical recipes for devil's food cake with coconut icing? Did I expect to see only recipes for so-called traditional mountain desserts, like apple stack cake, apple leather, and pie made with sulfured apples? I must have. While the cookbook contains some recipes that I apparently expected to find in the southern mountains, apple dumplings, biscuits, and chow chow. It also has a plethora of recipes I did not expect to see, from royal fruit dressing to date nut fondant to streusel. It also contains recipes for some creations that seem downright bizarre to imagine on South Turkey Creek, where my grandmother spent the last 50 years of her life. A handwritten recipe for grape ketchup to be eaten with fried eggs, meat, or lima beans. It's like a chutney or something. And my favorite, fig pickles. And I tell you, figs don't do well in Western North Carolina. It seems as though she started the cookbook in 1936, the same year she married my grandfather. She saved a dental snuff advertising booklet with 1936 and 1937 calendars in the back and empty pages that she filled with recipes. 
In those pages, my grandmother wrote a recipe for tomato ketchup that instructs the reader to use a food chopper. I lingered over this detail for a long time. My grandmother, who later struggled to make ends meet while raising tobacco and three children, had a food chopper. Now granted, it was probably one of the inexpensive, almost certainly inexpensive, like handheld ones, but it still wasn't essential, and she had one. I was also surprised to see so many recipes that featured product ingredients, from Bisquick to Swan's Down flour to Calumet baking powder. The one that really got and still gets my attention is the recipe for blossom thyme cake that instructs, now, while your orchard is all abloom is just the time to entertain your club. I guarantee she did not have a club. Give a shower or just have a party for no other reason than that beautiful drift of pink or white. Bring spring indoors by decorating a big marble cake with sugared blossoms, a centerpiece that's lovely to behold, luscious to eat with real blossoms on top, sugar dipped for sparkle. It sounds really labor intensive. It's not that these recipes are unusual in the mid 20th century South. And it may be, probably is, that the cookbook was more of a wish book than a guide to everyday cooking for my grandmother. As food waste scholar Megan J. Elias points out, cookbooks are aspirational texts that represent desirable lifestyles and values. But I cannot stop thinking about the fact that despite my immersion in the interdisciplinary field of Appalachian studies and the burgeoning field of food ways, until finding this cookbook, I never imagined that my grandmother, whom I had always thought of as distinctly mountain in terms of cultural identity, would have saved recipes between 1936 and 1952, the last dated entry in the book, for pecan loaves, cheese twists, baby Ruth cookies, jiffy featherweight biscuits, oh wait, I lost my place, Kellogg's Krispies marshmallow squares, why is that? Had I imagined my own romanticized version of cured ham, leather britches, pickled watermelon, and apple stack cake, only to find that my grandmother's culinary tastes were far more varied? Had I expected her to use ingredients procured on the farm and not from the store? Moreover, how had such a powerful script come to dominate the way I imagined my grandmother's cooking without me even knowing it existed until I confronted its antithesis. What implicit judgments had I made about my grandmother based on the foods I imagined she would have been interested in cooking? Where did my Appalachian food script come from, and how have mountain residents responded to those scripts? These are the questions this book begins to answer. So the book is about mountain food, and it's not about mountain food. It's about representations of mountain food and what those say about national and regional perceptions of mountain people. It's the whole if you are what you eat sort of paradigm. Um, so I tried to make this lecture pretty Virginia-centric, so I hope you find it interesting. Um, we're going to talk about the cookbook just a little bit here at the beginning. So here's a picture of the cover. You can see um, here those pages that probably really were nibbled um, by mice. And then I showed you this one. It's near the back. This is the one with the tips. And the fruitcake advice is right here, mailing fruitcakes. Um, there's also advice for making your own little flour sifter contraption to make gravy making easier, and you could keep it right there by the stove. Um, I really like the washable scarf one. It's about how to keep the collar of your coat clean. So if you don't want to have to wash your coat a lot or every winter, then you just line the neck with a washable scarf, wash your scarf, and there you go. You've got a clean neck to your coat. Um, there's also one about washing ivory handles, and I wondered if this was aspirational. I never heard my mother talk about ivory handle silverware in the home, um, but maybe it was there, and I just didn't know that it was there. 
Here's what some of the some of the recipes look like, and I'm sure you have these in your own family as well. I just didn't know I had one in my family. Um, I chose this one because it it does a lot to represent kind of a big conceptual topic that I talk about in the book. On the left, we've got this handwritten recipe that uses local ingredients that before finding the cookbook, I would have said, yes, that's distinctly mountain. You know, blackberries grew on the property. She picked them in the summer. She canned them. She used them to make blackberry pudding. Um, this is a recipe for blackberry pudding that she says you're supposed to top, you know, use it as a topping for a cake. And then you put meringue on top of that and brown it. And um, my favorite part of this recipe is that she's got instructions here, and then she says, now take, and underlines it, um, which just sounds like what she would say. And then over here, we've got an example of a product recipe. So um, it's obviously from the bottom of a baking pan or dish. And when I first saw it, I thought it was pineapple upside down cake, but it's not. It's banana upside down cake. And I was so surprised, bananas become this kind of culinary cultural hinge point in this book. They come up over and over, which is so odd because you don't typically associate bananas with Appalachia given that it's not a tropical climate. Um, but it becomes a kind of cultural shorthand, which I will talk about. And okay, so for this lecture, I decided what made the most sense is to kind of do a deep dive into chapter one, which is one of the more historical chapters, and then I'll give you quick overviews of the other ones, and then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the conclusion, which brings us up to the contemporary moment. Let me get some water. Okay, so let's have some interaction. When do you think Appalachian Studies scholars say the idea of Appalachia became a distinct concept in the American imagination? So nationally speaking, when do you think Americans started thinking about Appalachia as a region separate from the rest of the country and separate from the South. 1970s. 70s, 1970s. Yeah. Okay, throw out some more. 20s, 1920s. 1840. 1840. That was specific. Who said that? <laughs> okay, okay. I'm going to guess earlier, but we'll just start with PDA. 1930s. Okay. 19 teens. 19 teens. Anybody else? 1940s? Mr. 1840, tell me why you said 1840. Why did you say 1840? Because that's when the Western world was opening up about bringing more people to Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll say that everybody's answer makes sense. And you can certainly point to any of those dates and say there's increased interest in this time, especially in the 60s with the War on Poverty, Lyndon B. Johnson, et cetera, Charles Kuralt, Christmas in Appalachia. We can talk about pronunciation, too, if you want. That's always fun. Um, but most historians agree, not everybody agrees about this, but most agree that that idea kind of became cemented in the American consciousness post-Reconstruction, that before the Civil War, what we think of now as Appalachia was just the frontier. You know, it was kind of the wild, wild west. There's a genre of literature that was really popular called Southwestern humor, and it was not set in Texas or New Mexico or Arizona. It was primarily in East Tennessee. That was the Southwest. Um, George Washington Harris was one of those, uh, one of the best known writers. He had this character called Sut Love and Good, who was kind of a buffoon and really funny. Um, but anyway, in the years following Reconstruction, for a number of reasons, which is a whole other separate lecture, we can talk about during Q&A if you want to, 
um, there was kind of this conflation of forces that included progressive era reformers who were doing a lot of uplift work that centered exclusively in some cases on regions in Appalachia that had a lot to do with race. Um, and also local color fiction. And so that's what I wanna spend some time talking about here. There's been a ton of work done on this genre of literature. So fiction, novels, short stories. And this was a genre of literature that was geared primarily towards mainstream, careful quotes, readers, um, who were essentially looking for a literary vacation. They wanted to read about a place that was very different than where they were with characters who sounded different than people they knew in their everyday lives with locations that were described as exotic and usually beautiful. So primarily the readers of a lot of this fiction were in the Northeast. They were readers of magazines like Lippincott's, Scribner's, Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, um, Kate Chopin is the perfect example of a local color writer. She writes about Louisiana. There were also writers who focused exclusively on Appalachia. There was Mary Noalice Murphy, who was not from the mountains. Her family was extremely wealthy, and Murfreesboro, Tennessee is named after her family. Murphy, North Carolina is named after her family. And she had some physical impairments, thought the mountain air would do her good, and she spent a lot of time in East Tennessee. Uh, John Fox Jr. is another one. Appalachian Studies scholars have really ripped these writers to the bone um, for perpetuating some really damaging stereotypes. Um, you'll read depictions of lank, listless mountaineers. Moonshine is almost always involved. Degeneracy, illiteracy, incest. Um, any ugly stereotype, name it, and you'll find it in a lot of that literature. So uh, it was popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Those years following Reconstruction, turn of the 20th century, very, very popular. Uh, John Fox Jr.'s Trail of the Lonesome Pine was published in 1908, for example. It was a national bestseller. National readers could not get enough of it. Um, there was a feud, there was moonshine, there was a beautiful girl had all the, the plot details to keep readers interested. So what I was interested in is how was food depicted in this literature. So you've got local color, which is meant to be fictional, um, but it had a lot to do with shaping national perceptions of mountain people. And in fact, a lot of that fiction was used in anthropology classes to teach college students about Appalachia as late as the 60s and 70s. Um, so it was really powerful stuff. There's also a sort of companion genre of travel writing, which is supposed to be true, um, and people would take trips and write about it, but it's really creative nonfiction, and you could exaggerate as much as you wanted. So I was sort of... Um, cocky when I started this research and I thought I knew exactly what I was going to find and I thought I was going to find really um, offensive depictions of mountain food that correlated with mountain people and I did. I found a lot of those. There's a ton. The chapter's very long but I found some surprises too. Some very refreshing oh thank god surprises which I'll tell you about. Um, but in terms of what I expected to find, I've got another graphic in just a second. Um, the word course, C-O-A-R-S-E, kept coming up. Like every other page, it felt like the word was either used to describe the people in the story or the travel narrative or the food. So if it was used to describe the people, then it meant they were uncouth, they were uncivilized, they were unsophisticated, they were uneducated, they were not people with whom you would want to spend time. Super offensive. If it was used to describe the food, then that terrible, greasy, coarse food. It was greasy. It was not properly prepared. The cook was lacking culinary know-how. It was not sophisticated, and it was definitely prone to cause dyspepsia. Um, so really nasty things about the food. And the idea is that 
coarse people equal coarse food and vice versa. It's back to the you are what you eat sort of um, paradigm. So I've got an example of one that um, supported what I thought I would find and one that surprised me. So on the left <laughs> is an illustration from a travel narrative. This is supposedly true. We've got James Lane Allen. The caption is up on the top. Um, he was from Kentucky, but he was from Lexington. He was from the bluegrass. He was not from eastern Appalachian, Kentucky. He didn't even like writing about Appalachian, Kentucky, but his editors did because his readers liked it. So he would do it from time to time. And he has this theoretically nonfiction piece called Through Cumberland Gap on Horseback. It's from 1886. He says he was traveling through Burnside, Kentucky, where Harriet Simpson Arno was from, and he comes upon a fruit stand. And note that the railroad has recently come through the region, so that's important. And there are bananas at this fruit stand. And he says that a local mountain man walks in and sees the bananas and says to him, <laughs> Blame the me if them ain't the darndest beans I've ever seen. <laughs> and the intended response is what we all just did, right? We're supposed to laugh at this man. Um, the depiction is incredibly offensive. He doesn't have shoes. His pants are all, like, you know, in tatters at the bottom. His eyes are all big. He's looking kind of wall-eyed, side-eyed at the bananas, like he's afraid they're going to attack him. Um... And so, you know, I laughed, and then I thought, I'm also offended. It's like the Flannery O'Connor move, you know, where you laugh, and then you feel terrible that you laughed. And so I started doing some research, and turns out that bananas were incredibly difficult to get at this time in America. Um, they had only been exhibited at the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition in 1876. That was 10 years before. If you lived in a port city like New Orleans, you had pretty easy access to bananas, but for towns and communities in the interior, like in Burnside, Kentucky, it's remarkable that they had bananas at all. So rather than noting, oh wow, this is such a sign of progressivism and modernity, he turns it into a joke and so that this man becomes a kind of spectacle. Um, I was all fired up about it and talking to Ronnie Lundy. Um, if you all don't know her work, she wrote Vittles, uh, spelled V-I-C-T-U-A-L-S, and she has a phonetic pronunciation on the cover. It's a wonderful cookbook. It won two James Beard Awards. It's all about Appalachian food. And I told her this story, and she said, yeah, you know, and also that mountain man may have been playing him the fool. And, like, it may have been that the joke was on James Lane Allen, as if, if you think that about me, then fine, I'll let you just keep on thinking that about me. So, I don't know which one it was, but there are tons of examples um, like that from the 1800s and 1900s. And there are certain foods that come up again and again. So, anything that's foraged was just considered barbaric. Um, greasy greens, poke salad... Um, the, the one that I'm blanking on, dandelion greens, plantain greens, um, those were all just like the most uncivilized heathen food you could imagine. Um, people always complained about too much grease, uh, beans were complained about, cornbread for sure, um, yeah. Basically, all of the food that's now very expensive at farm-to-table restaurants, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Um, okay. Then there is a body of literature that I found very surprising that doesn't just sort of toe the line of, um, you know, uncivilized mountaineer and, and coarse food. So the one I decided to talk about, and there are several, is this man, David Hunter Strother, who was born in 1816 in Martinsburg in Beckley County, West Virginia, which was then Virginia. Um, he was a very, very, very well-known illustrator and really popular in the 1850s. He was also a writer. 
And he's got this story that EGADS was published in seven installments, it's so long, um, called A Winter in the South. And the first publication was in 1857. And it's based on a real trip that he took with his family that started in Berkeley Springs. And it starts at the spa. And he's essentially making fun of the, the health nuts um, who are all eating things that he finds strange. And uh, the protagonist in the story has travel companions and they go through different parts of Appalachia. And by and large, the portrayal of the food that they eat is very positive. And I was trying to figure out why is that? I mean, I think part of it is that the food probably was really good and he was telling the truth. Um, it was also before the Civil War. So those trade routes had not been disrupted yet. I think tables probably were quite a bit more plentiful in the 1850s than in the 1860s. He was especially complimentary about East Tennessee. He loved Jonesboro, he loved Johnson City. And um, this is a drawing or a rendering of the interior of a cabin in Tennessee. And I don't know about you, but this does not look like squalor to me. Um, it looks like a really nice, well-equipped space. And you can see here that there's some kind of food hanging. My guess is that it's beans. It could be peppers. Um, you know, child is playing here in the floor. And then there's even a clock. So there's money for material goods as well. So moving out of this chapter, I'll give you, oh, right, right, right archival finds were really fun and um, kind of blew up that local color narrative that was in all of those publications. So that's another point that I try to make a lot in this book is that the national narrative is often dramatically different than the regional archival narrative. And that the more private the documentation, often the more nuanced. Um, and I really got into that in chapter two, but I pulled Virginia examples to talk about. So these slides come from the food and drink collection at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. And I don't know that much about the woman who collected these. It's a scrapbook that's really fascinating. Her name was Betty D. Kramer, and she lived in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, she started collecting in 1883, and the reason I pulled the one on the left is because it's for lobster Farsi. So who had access to lobster in Wheeling, West Virginia, five years after Reconstruction ended? I mean, a really wealthy family, that's who. Um, and there's also this, I mean, fairly complicated recipe for the sauce. That's what all this is. And then there's breadcrumbs, and it sounds really good. And apparently this woman, Gallagher, Gallagher, I don't know, um, wrote it down for Betty, and she saved it. And then the one over here on the right I pulled because it makes clear that, one, she received publications. Now, I don't know if they were regional or if they were national, but... The fact that she saved this clipping indicates that she's into health trends and she wants to know what's recommended and she's going to save it and she's going to refer to it. And it's also really funny. I thought you might enjoy looking at some of this. So like, um, did you know that red onions are an excellent diuretic and the white ones are recommended to be eaten raw as a remedy for insomnia? You get into some really bizarre um, stuff, but... Yeah, so that's that example. And then this one, I have really found down the research rabbit hole on this. This is from um, the Litchfield family household ledger. And it's from the 1870s to the 1890s. Probably a woman named Elizabeth collected these for over 20 years. Um, and her family was extremely wealthy, and they lived in Abingdon, Virginia, so not too far from you all. And it's for oil mangoes. And when I opened that in the reading room, I was like, wait, mango mangoes? They didn't have mango mangoes. What's going on? And 
So I emailed all my food friends, and um, the two people who helped me the most were April McGregor and David Shields. Um, April is a master canner and preserver and writer. She writes in Garden and Gun and Oxford and American. And David is a scholar extraordinaire. And they both helped me determine that mangoes were either bell peppers or maybe cantaloupe. Um, I don't think this one is for cantaloupe because it says take 40 mangoes. So I think <laughs> it's peppers. Um, and also because of the spices, there's, let's see, I don't know if I can find it here. There's horseradish, there's garlic, um, there's allspice, and there's turmeric. Can you imagine what it would take to get turmeric five years after the end of the Civil War in Abingdon, Virginia? So this is not a family that was foraging for their food or making, maybe they made things that were very greasy, but it had turmeric in it. I don't know. Um, but it really flies in the face of that kind of national narrative from local color literature. So, oh, and this. This is from the Grove Park Inn in um, Asheville, which opened in, I believe, 1913. I meant to look that up. It was either 1912 or 1913. And I sh wanted to show you this because I just think it's so funny and strange. I didn't know until I started this book project that the Grove Park Inn was a health resort with really strict rules. They had curfews and these kind of sanctions if you weren't quiet during quiet hour. And at the turn of the 20th century, I also learned that concern about digestion and dyspepsia really was paramount. So like at Kellogg's Sanitarium, Sanatorium, Sanitarium, the Kellogg cereal guy, um, people tried really hard to digest properly. There was this guy, Horace Fletcher, like if you look up Fletcherism, he recommended chewing your food into oblivion before swallowing it, and this all had to do with digestion. And uh, I wanted to show you this one. It says, Little Neck Clam Cocktail, a special sauce prepared for Grove Park Inn, mild in condiment and not difficult to digest. <laughs> um, and it's just these really granular, elaborate menus that list everything. And there's, I've got a picture of a breakfast menu. I didn't put it up because it's really blurry and not very good quality. Um, but it talks about how long the oatmeal is cooked. Um, so if you're worried about digesting your oats, fear not, because it's been cooked for a really, really long time. Um, Okay, so I want to move through this really quickly, but if you just, I wanted to give you an idea of kind of the, the narrative arc um, of the book. So my question was, okay, if this is how food is written about nationally in the late 1800s, early 1900s versus what you're finding in archives, what are progressive era reformers saying about food in the mountains? Because at the same time, there's also a tremendous effort at what was called mountain uplift. So this was a nationwide effort, but it was especially popular in Appalachia. Schools were opened, big focus on nutrition, sanitation, hygiene, clean water, domestic labor, domestic instruction, cooking instruction, and I was interested in the narrative that these progressive era reformers were telling Americans. How did they raise money to help people in need? And did those people actually need the help that they said they did? Um, that was another driving question. So I realized pretty quickly that that was an enormous topic and I got really overwhelmed with information so I ended up doing three case studies. I talk about Olive Dame Campbell and John C. Campbell, who did a tour through the mountains and also opened the John C. Campbell Folk School. Um, I talk about William Goodell Frost, president of Berea College for a long time, from 1892 to 1920, and his second wife, Eleanor Marsh Frost. He called her Nellie. He loved her. They have all these letters back and forth that are so sweet. Um, 
and a very problematic figure named Thomas Robinson Dolly, who thought that the answer to what he called the mountain problem was child labor. Um, but he also wrote a ton about food, and he wasn't even popular in his time, so that's probably why you've never heard of him, and it's for the best. Um, but just as an example, what I found, well, the big thing that I found and what the chapter argues is that the public discourse was often very generalized and very focused on need and poverty. But if you kept drilling down and you got into private documents, things got much more interesting and much more nuanced. So for example, William Goodall Frost might give a speech and when he talked about you know, the nutritional need in the mountains, and that might very well be true in certain places. But what he didn't talk about were the things his wife Nellie wrote about in her diary. She took trips on horseback um, with companions all through the mountains so that she could give advice to curriculum planners at Berea College. And what she recorded is completely fascinating. She would write about one family who was just economically prosperous. They had a lazy Susan on the dining room table. They had all these different kinds of jams and jellies. It was a lovely, clean environment with abundant food. And then in the next valley, she would encounter dire poverty and need for, um, for help. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really the thrust of that chapter. Chapter three looks at how writers are responding to government initiatives. And I talk about this really interesting program called the Live at Home Program in North Carolina which was very problematic, and we can get into that if you want to. Um, chapter four is about food stigma and food shaming, and this is a topic I could talk about forever. The social meaning that food carries with it and the power that it has to elevate or demote your social standing based on context, time, and place. The best example I can think of is ramps. In the 1950s, mid 20th century, this was not a food that you bragged about. This was your first, you know, greens. This was your tonic for the spring. And now it's a foodie food. It's more than $20 a pound at Whole Foods. It's on restaurant menus all over the place for exorbitant prices. So there's a lot to talk about there. And then chapter five talks about food um, celebration and how Appalachian writers were writing about that long before it was trendy. So before I run out of time, I'm determined to tell you these last two things. My, my big point in the conclusion is that I think it's wonderful that mountain food is being celebrated now, that nationally people are paying attention. And if you doubt me, as one irate man did at a book talk, <laughs> I brought the Bon Appetit magazine from April. It's the travel issue, and it has a 16-page spread on Appalachian food called Appalachia Anew. There are articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post. Crystal Wilkinson's new book on Appalachian food um, is a bestseller. It's really hot. I think that's great. However, Public perceptions of Appalachian people have not experienced the same elevation. And that's where I think we really need to pay attention and be careful. Um, if you want to see some examples of mountain food on restaurants, websites, because of copyright, I didn't feel comfortable taking those images. So I just put them up here and you can look those up yourself. But uh, Sean Brock's Audrey in Nashville, John Fleer's Rhubarb in Asheville, Travis Milton's Hickory at Nice Wonder Farms in Bristol, any of those places you'll find things like sour corn butter, salt rising bread, country ham, kilt lettuce, I put a definition just in case, candy roaster squash, leather britches or shucky beans, dried beans, ramps, other foraged foods, creasy greens, if you can get them. Um, and then the thing that I'll close with is the writer who I think helps us make sense of this. What does it mean if you're from this place and grew up eating these foods and now you see them on menus and chicken and dumplings are $55? 
What does that mean and what do you do with that? And the fact that so-called trash food is often now associated with mountain people, which is extraordinarily problematic and I would love to talk about. There's a writer, Robert Geip, um, who does illustrated novels and he's got a trilogy that deals with this. And it's an area that's been ravaged by mountaintop removal. Opioid addiction is rampant. And the protagonist of this book loves to cook. And she's changing recipes. And instead of apple stack cake, it's lemon poppy seed stack cake. And her mother just doesn't know what to think about it and doesn't know what to do. And they have a party. And there's an apple stack cake. And her mother gets so frustrated and throws it out on the hillside. And this is the last two slides. And she says, I went in there and seen that cake so perfect, and I thought to myself, I don't want to see that cake on Instagram. I just want us to eat it and then us remember it. I don't want to see it online all cropped and filtered and looking like an advertisement for something. I just want it to be cake, a cake we ate together. And there's this meal that they eat at the end where he's got all these foods. There's beanie weenies and there's cornbread and there's um, apple stack cake and there's pinto beans. And the mother says it looked like the prize display on Wheel of Fortune if all the prizes was food, um, which I think is a great way to end. And I'd love to take your questions. <laughs>